Okay, so welcome also from here, from Germany, actually from Berlin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, lecturer of uh, this year's Easing Lectures. This is uh, Reinhard Volk from the University of Linz in Austria. So Reinhard has a long-standing collaboration with uh, Joko Holowatsch's group in Lviv. And he is also a frequent guest, so he was many, many times already in Lviv. And uh, their work, uh, their joint work, uh, was in many fields, but one I remember best is uh, the field theoretic treatment of disordered systems. And then later they joined their interest in the history of the easing model and uh, worked together on, on these issues. And that's also the title of his lecture today. That is the survival of Ernst Easing and the struggle to solve this model or his model. And that's the first part. And tomorrow there will be a second part of this lecture. And I guess we are now really curious. Maybe also Thomas Easing is curious to hear what Reinhardt has to say about the survival of Ernst Easing. Okay, so thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk uh, at this uh, meeting. And uh, I hope you see already the first uh, transparency. Do you see it? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, okay. so <clears throat> I start. Uh, I welcome everybody, especially also Tom. And uh, here I have a citation of Giulini. He begins his summary on his article on Wolfgang Pauli's classical non-describable to valiantness with the statement, understanding the generations of new ideas and the mechanism that led to their acceptance is a common central concern of historians of science, philosophers of science, and the working scientists themselves. And uh, I share this statement, but how knowledge flows via which persons and which institutions depends essentially on political and economical circumstances. And this holds in particular for the period considered in this talk. So let me go back and then follow the development of the ideas step by step. So 100 years ago, the Spanish flu ended in the 20s. The Great War was over and the Roaring Twenties began. Not only in Berlin, but also in Hamburg, people danced on the volcano. However, the funding, founding of the University of Hamburg in 1919 was more important for science. Uh, you, at these universities at the beginning, four persons are important uh, for this talk. There was uh, Wilhelm Lenz, he came 1921. In the winter semester 1922, Walter Schottky, then 22, Wolfgang Pauli. In 1923, uh, we had Otto Stern at the university. It was the Hamburg University it was the first parliament chosen by the citizens of Hamburg in a free and fair election, making University Hamburg the first democratically founded university in Germany. And it opened on Ernst Easing's birthday on 10th of May, 1919. The young university early days in the 1920s were marked by success, thanks to the outstanding solars. It soon rose to international fame during the era of Weimar Republic. These four persons are very important for our 
story. Wilhelm Lenz, he was the professor for theoretical physics in 1921. He got the chair. He studied in Göttingen, then was in Munich with Sommerfeld, was in the First World War radio operator, Extraordinarius in Rostock, and then he came to uh, Hamburg. He worked uh, especially also on ferromagnetism. And one of the big problems was the understanding of the Curie temperature, a term we now find, uh, find already in TV series. For instance, in the CSI series, bad works. Um, a teenager died from inhaling smoke during a fire before firemen came, could rescue her. The CSI people had to uncover the circumstances of her death. And they proceed in their analysis by using the property of a refrigerator magnet. You see, Nick has it in his hand. He said, demagnetized. And Catherine, I'm not following. Okay, the Curie point is the temperature at which all materials lose their magnetic properties. Okay, she said. For iron, it is about 932 Fahrenheit or 77.3 degrees of Kelvin. And, and so he knew what was the temperature in the kitchen. But physicists have a little bit more uh, to say to the Curie temperature. You see here how the magnetization goes down with, with increasing the temperature. And here you have the Curie temperature. The understanding was that you had small little elementary magnets which order when it comes to magnetization. And this problem had two levels, a microscopic level, where come these small arrows, these small elementary magnets from it, should come from the electrons, and it has a macroscopic level. Uh, in the beginning, solid state theory, uh, the macroscopic magnetism comes about by interaction of these magnets, and uh, it should, they should align to give a macroscopic magnetization. It was also known that uh, ferromagnetism was a quantum mechanical problem. And Lenz had in 1920 contributed to this problem a paper uh, in which he uh, explained the fact of spontaneous magnetization, spontane magnetisierung, by assuming a directionality of the atoms. Only certain orientations of the elementary magnets should be allowed. The common orientation in the ferromagnetic phase came about by non-magnetic forces, non-magnetic forces, because the magnetic forces were too small to explain the Curie temperature. It was too large. And these forces were of unknown origin. It should be noted that Einstein noted when he was asked about the professorship in Hamburg, who should get the chair, I estimate Lenz similar to Debye and especially consider his last, for the time being, only very incomplete publicized work on band spectra and magnetism, and there was this one extremely important. Now, uh, Lenz got the chair, and in 1922, Walter Schottke came to Hamburg for one semester. And he had published in this year in Hamburg uh, a paper which could explain the Curie temperature. And he said the Coulomb energy should be the reason for the interaction of these uh, elementary magnets for the electrons. And there is a rotoactive directivity. I will explain this later. Now, uh, I come to Ernst Ising, one of the later students of Hamburg, and speak shortly about the family we already have heard. He was born in Kolomb, then he went to Bochum, made there his 
uh, ended his uh, high school time uh, by Matura, and then he had to start with a military training. Fortunately, World War I ended before he had to go to war. And in 1919, he began studying physics and mathematics in Göttingen, the mecca of mathematics, as one said at that time. And after one semester interruption, he studied astronomy in Bonn and came on April 21, 1921 to Hamburg. I would like to mention that about the same time in 1920, another student in Norway entered uh, the university. It was Lars, a young man named Lars Onsaga. He was admitted to the uh, uh, high uh, university in Trondheim. Now, you see here the persons which were working on the problem of magnetism in Hamburg. Here again, Lenz, who had the chair, the young student who came from to Hamburg, and he got a, a, a thesis of the topic of to explain macroscopic magnetism. 1900, 1922, Pauli came from Göttingen to Hamburg for habilitation, and he worked, so to say, on quantum mechanics, but on the atomic magnetism, on the explaining how atoms and molecules behave in magnetic fields. In 1922, from Würzburg in the winter semester to 1923, uh, Schottke was there with his uh, paper. Now, I think this paper uh, was the reason that end of 1922, Lenz suggested easing to find the magnetization of ferromagnetism. There is today no exact solution for the easing model considered in a magnetic field in high dimensions. So the task of Ernst easing was a mission impossible. And I would like to start to look on this mission. Here you see, so to say, the survival of Ernst Ising. It's from the year 1966. Here you see his struggle, the thesis, what he could reach when he had got the topic. And on the other side, you see Father Brown, uh, a person from Lewis Carroll's poem, which was cited by Barry McCoy, an expert in the easing model, in a talk 20, uh, uh, 2016, when he spoke about his understanding, or better to say, his not understanding the easing models. And in the background, you see a sculpture called All Over Store, which is made of ball pens in a room. You see, so to say, little elementary magnets. Now let me come immediately to the thesis of 1924. It was finished. And here you have the, uh, the topics treated. It's a, a large part on the solution for the linear change. But the easing, the e easing thesis contained more. It contained then the trials to go to the three or higher dimensional space. So he looked at transverse positions of the elementary magnetons and more positions uh, possible instead of only two. And then he looked at the double chain with uh, uh, simultaneous action of ejectant elements. So it is called the easing letter today. And he also looked at the linear chain, which not only next nearest neighbor interactions, but also next nearest interactions. And uh, he also gave uh, an introduction to this topic. Um, and you see here the citations he had made in the thesis. And I want uh, to restrict myself to the oldest citation and to the newest one. And the oldest citation came from uh, 
articles on the history of magnetism and there uh, were publications of Felix Auerbach, a professor in Jena on the, in theoretical physics. And he had written an article about magnetism in the handbook of physics uh, and also a little book called Geschichtstafeln, history tables. And you find in these history tables under the year 1797, the directional uh, hypothesis of magnetism and the name Kirwan. Now, Kirwan, Richard Kirwan uh, was an Irish uh, natural scientist and in the year 1797 he had written uh, an interesting article uh, in, uh, in the transaction of the Royal Irish Academy and it was translated in fact into German uh, in Annalen der Physik and there he looked at the magnetism similar to crystallization. He uh, thought that magnetism consists in alignment of elementary magnets by an interaction of these magnets. And this was a very interesting hypothesis. He could not prove it, of course. So unfortunately, uh, Kirwan dropped out of the history of magnetism because after uh, articles, reviews on the magnetism, uh, uh, after 1920, no further, uh, he, was, he was not mentioned further. The same in some sense uh, appeared to the newest citation that was the paper of Schottky. And I think it's some kind of anticipation of the exchange interaction because he wanted to explain why Colo the Coulomb energy is the energy uh, which could explain the value of the Curie temperature. And I explain it in, in, in an example of two elect electrons circulating on its planetary path around the nucleus. And if they circle in the same direction, they look, the elementary magnet, magnetic moments look in the same direction. And if they are synchronized by some way, they can rotate with the largest possible distance around the nucleus. And it's this, uh, you, the, by Pythagoras, you can calculate this red largest distance. But if you now reverse the circulation of the lowest electron, you see that they cannot keep the largest distance. They have to come together by a smaller distance. And so he calculated the energy difference of these distances. And it turned out he got a, degree, he got a value of 10 to 12 Earth and that would be 10 to 3 degrees. So this 1000 uh, Kelvin is the value of the Curie temperature. It is the right dimension. But his easing said he was careful. We can give no further details about these forces, which may be of an electric nature. However, we assume that they quickly fade away with the distance so that we only need to consider the effect of neighboring elements. And indeed, uh, the problems with quantum mechanics in the following years also led to a forgetting of Schottky's paper. So therefore, also these two uh, citations, Kirwan and Schottky, do not appear in the publication of easing thesis and in the future publications. So let me go to the thesis and how uh, easing formulated the problem. So he looked at a chain and then he looked at elementary uh, magnets along the chain in this direction, in the other direction, against each other and so on. But it's not the direction which is really important in the problem. 
it's the parallelism or anti-parallelism of the problem. So if the two elementary magnets are in the same direction, they are plus plus, and if they are in the other direction, they are minus minus or plus minus or minus plus. And only if they are plus minus or minus plus, there is an energy needed because you have this change of circulation according to Schottky. So these are the places which cost energy. And therefore, knowing this energy cost, he could calculate the partition function, how it was calculated at that time. So you have to have the number of the microstates of the change. These are the plus minus in the change. And then what they cost in energy, the weight of these microstates. And these are uh, with the plus states, the minus states in a magnetic field, it costs energy. And at the energy places, you have, uh, it costs energy. And the number of energy places is sigma, the number of the plus places, nu one and nu two. And now, Easing had formulated it to a combinatorial problem. I go through very quickly through the uh, calculation. So first he has to find the number of microstates, the plus and minus. And these are given by combinatorial. It's only, so you have only uh, integers the number of the plus places, integers of the number of the minus places, and the whole integers of the chain and places. And therefore you have to look at the distribution of these places and the possibility, and these are given by binomial coefficients. So he could calculate the number of microstates depending on the orientation of uh, the boundary uh, uh, elementary magnets, and it's given by this binomial uh, 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 formula. Now, the partition function has then uh, to be weighted by the weights, by the Boltzmann weights, uh, which are already also given by the numbers nu1, nu2, and uh, the, uh, element, the energy places, and you have to calculate this sum, and the sum has here the total number of the chain, how many places are in the chain. And so you have to calculate the partition function as a number of uh, the length of the chain. That is very complicated. You cannot calculate this one, and therefore here the following idea, it's a trick. So do do not look at the partition function of one length, look at the partition function of all length, multiply by a number x, by a parameter x to the power of n, sum it over, and you get a function. And let us calculate this function. This is a re re rearrangement trick, I think very clever. And, uh, so he did this, he calculated this function f of x. So you see, he summed up over all n and n disappeared. But what appears is x. So he, some functions of x appear. It's complicated, but uh, I do not want to go into detail, but to show you the tricks. So he lo lost n and the function of x can be calculated. He could do these sums. And so it's a, well, an easy function of x. It's a rational function. And then the trick is to expand this function again in powers of n. And if you have the contribution for the nth power, you have the partition function of the change of length n. Now there is also the fine feature that only one of these two W terms, only this one is larger than one, this one is smaller than one, and for large N, it's easily calculated. You only have to 
take into account for calculating the partition function set only W1. And he did it. And then it contains the magnetic field in a parameter. Here's the magnetic field. And deriving for the magnetic field, the logarithm of the partition function gives you the overall magnetization. And this is his result for the chain. And the conclusion was that for a magnetic field zero, alpha equal to zero, there is no magnetization. There is no ferromagnetic phase transition in the linear change. And that was a disappointing uh, result. So, but from this result he made, after all his trials to go to a three-dimensional body, solid, uh, he came to the conclusion in the thesis, as is zu vermuten. So it is to suppose that this statement also applies to a special model. And then in his uh, printed short uh, version of the thesis, he also said there is a supposition that even within the three-dimensional analog model, ferromagnetic behavior is not achieved. And then, unfortunately, in the publication, he said that he has no magnetization in the change. He said it is shown that such a model does not yet have ferromagnetic properties. And this statement also extends to the three dimensional model. So he was not so careful as in the beginning only to say it uh, is to suggest, but he said it extends. And that was a too strong statement. Now I come to the judgment of the thesis of uh, easing and Lenz wrote a one page judgment. And I just uh, tell you uh, two points. He pointed to the remarkable skill of Ernst in this thesis. He formulated the disappointment and the belief that the magnetic, uh, ferromagnetic state might be not a state of thermal equilibrium. And then he came to the judgment of the thesis. And he first he wrote good, second. But then he changed to excellent. And he included that there are also methodically new things and therefore he gave excellent. Now people didn't look so much for this excellent, uh, for this mathetic, uh, mathematical new things. But I looked at the literature and found two citations. One of a Princeton mathematician, uh, uh, it was Mood, uh, who in his thesis, the distribution theory of runs in a mathematical statistical journal, published it. It was not until 1925, uh, as far as the author has been able to ascertain, ascertain that uh, the actual distribution function when easing citation, he cited the paper, gave the number of ways of obtaining a given number of total number of runs. So he cites easing's mathematical treatment. And also T.S. Chang, he was a student of Fowler. Uh, he, Fowler was also an important physician and mathematician in statistical physics. And he also uh, noted that easing gave for the first time a formula for the arrangement with given number of neighbors and so on. So these were the mathematical new things, already very late citations. Now the easing uh, um, paper was immediately cited at the uh, meeting of the um, German Physical Society by Herzfeld. Herzfeld uh, was uh, the first who commented Easing's the the thesis. He gave also a piles-like argument 
that in the chain no ferromagnetism is possible. It's a usual chain later made by uh, uh, Landau, namely that the, the entropy term is larger uh, for the unordered uh, uh, microstates than the energy term, and therefore uh, unordering is always winning in the free energy and you never get an ordered state with very low entropy. He also commented Schottky's paper and concluded to Schottky's arguments, so the question of the nature of the internal field in ferromagnetic bodies is still open. I want just to make, mention that Herzfeld was born in Vienna, where he also finished his studies, and he belonged to what uh, Eliot Montrol called the Vienna School of Statistical Thought. He wrote this in a paper in 1984. Herzfeld then found no position at the university in Vienna and he uh, emigrated to uh, the States and uh, uh, came to Hopkins University in Baltimore and later uh, in Maryland and where he got a regular faculty position. And so also in this way, statistical physics came to America. Now, the second important point for uh, the easing model is the breakdown of bohr sommerfeld's quantum mechanics. We have seen the reservation against the arguments of Schottky, against the planetary motion of the electrons around the uh, nucleus in the atom. So Schottky himself wrote, the more exact model-based investigation of all this question, how electrons move in the atom, will not only lead to difficult calculations, but also require knowledge of general laws of motion and quantum. We are currently in no way sufficiently informed of that. How should synchronization come about and so on? And Pauli worked on this problem together, I have to say, with Heisenberg. For instance, two young uh, people, uh, they were not satisfied with the current uh, Bohr-Sommerfeld theory of quantum mechanics. There were big problems, the splitting of spectral lines in a magnetic field, the anomalous Seeman effect. And they could not calculate the energy levels for atoms and molecules with more than one uh, electron. So Heisenberg wrote to Pauli, for instance, all existent helium models are false. So Pauli treated these models in a publication, in two publications with, which were published in the same issue of the Zeitschrift for Physics, uh, 31, where Easing published his thesis. It was in the year 1925. And he said and explained the anomalous Seyman effect, the splitting of the lines uh, in a magnetic field, according to this point of view, the tablet structure, the splitting of the alkali spectra and the breach of the Lamour theorem came about by a peculiar, classically indescribable kind of ambiguity in the quantum theoretical properties of the luminous electron. And immediately after, he found uh, the Ausschluss principles, exclusion principle. In an atom, there cannot be two or more equivalent electrons for which the values of all now four quantum numbers coincide. So this peculiar kind of ambiguity was a new quantum number, which could be plus or minus, one or zero, and so on. It is the spin variable of the electron. And this principle he formulated said that uh, if there are two electrons, they have to be in two, in not with all four quantum numbers now, they could not be even, 
equal. And therefore he could explain how the periodic systems, how the electrons fill the shells in the periodic system. Now later, immediately later, so to say, uh, one looked for a classical explanation of the spin. And the first were chronic, he asked Pauli. Pauli said it's a funny idea and he should not publish this because Pauli didn't believe on a classical explanation of a rotating electrically charged electron which creates an elementary magneton. But two young other people, Uhlenbeck and Gautzmus, did and Pauli then themselves uh, worked with Dirac also on this new degree of freedom on the quantum mechanical level. And he found what's called the Pauli matrices. And uh, the interesting thing is that in order to understand this spin, it's not just the rotation of a, of a sphere, because if you would classically rotate a sphere, it would come to the same state after 300, 60 degrees of rotating. But the spin comes to its initial uh, uh, point after 720 degrees rotation. Though it's something new, it's something, a new symmetry. And Dirac also uh, could uh, create a theory including the spin and I have heard an interview with him where he said he tried to uh, make a theory for, for the electron not including the spin but symmetry reasons and the relativity theory forced him to include the spin. Now all these developments led finally Heisenberg to the uh, formulation of the new quantum mechanics. It was a matrix in matrix form. Uh, I cannot go into details, but within, within the new formalism of quantum mechanics, he could explain the ferromagnet, how ferromagnetism could come about. And it was very essential to have to know already that he has to consider the spin. So he wrote in his uh, introduction, and this is from an uh, English translation, vice molecular forces, it's a mean field theory, will be attributed to a quantum mechanical exchange phenomenon. And indeed it will be treated as the exchange process. He found that the description of the electron needs a, a, a wave function uh, which contains the coordinates of the electrons, the space, but also it should contain the spin state. And the whole uh, description of the electron should be of the kind of what we know now called the Fermi statistic. If you exchange the two electrons, the wave function should exchange its sign. And this could be done in two ways. Either you have a symmetrical form of the spatial wave function, or you have an anti-symmetrical form of the space wave function. And you may have the spins looking in the same direction, or in different direction. And so one of the parts always should be different. And it turns out that uh, by the exclusion principle that the spins should not be the same in the ferromagnetic state, but it should different. And therefore, the, uh, the, uh, if in the ferromagnetic state, it should be the same. And therefore in the spatial uh, part, it should be anti-symmetric. That means that the, the charge is distributed different in the state of parallel spins and anti-parallel spins. 
And the difference, with this difference in the spatial distributions, distributions of the electrons, you can calculate the Coulomb energy of, of the electronic state. And it turned out that the Coulomb energy is smallest for the parallel state of the spins. This is the exchange interaction of Heisenberg, which leads to the interaction which likes parallel spins. So he also commented then about the crystal lattice and he thought that, well, if it has enough neighbors, it could be uh, ferromagnetic uh, even in, uh, in either two-dimensional or three-dimensional lattices. And the quantum number of the electrons that are responsible for magnetism must be larger than three. We know better today, but uh, how, what happened until this time, at the end of the 20s, in the 30s, how uh, the life of easing proceeded? Well, he was, of course, uh, uh, he left university, he liked physics, but he found a position at the patent division of the General Electric uh, Company uh, in Berlin. And uh, so in Berlin, he met Johanna. Uh, but his real uh, wish for his future life was in physics, in teaching physics. And therefore he studied in Berlin, uh, a, a study uh, for becoming a teacher. And in 1930, he finished this study and he became a teacher. Now, he also decided to live together with Johanna. And Johanna, she was born 1922, two years uh, later uh, than easy, Ernst, in Berlin, and uh, she studied economics at the University of Berlin, and uh, she made a thesis there. You see here his, the, her thesis, and uh, she was called Johanna Ema, and the supervisor was Charlotte, Charlotte Leibuscher. Charlotte, Charlotte Leibuscher was half Jewish, and she lost 1933 uh, her habilitation and she emigrated uh, uh, to uh, Great Britain. Uh, the professor where Charlotte Leibuscher was assistant and where Johanna uh, worked was Franz Eulenburg. And since he had a lot of uh, supervised students at the time of 1933, he could stay longer at the university in order to finish this student. But later also Eulenburg, who was also Jewish, uh, he uh, was arrested by the Gestapo and for some reason unknown, uh, he uh, died in, in, in the prison. And Johanna, lost also their uh, position then in uh, the late 30s. But on 23 December of 1930, Ernst and Johanna married. Now I will finish this talk by the confer Solvay Conference of 1930, uh, switching now to the a uh, flow of the ideas. Pauli got a uh, 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 review lecture at this conference on magnetism. And he spoke about uh, the uh, atomic magnetism, but uh, he also uh, on, spoke on his important results where he got the Nobel Prize uh, of the magnetic electron. The title was Quantum Theory of Magnetism, the Magnetic Electron. There he presented also Ising's model. 
And of course, Heisenberg's model, the Heisenberg model. He the Heisenberg model is a vector model. It's a, it's a magnetic vector which rotates. Easing's model with his plus and minus is not a vector model. It's a scalar model. It's just parallelism or anti-parallelism. And he presented the easing model with some comments. He said, in easing's account, in terms of old quantum mechanics, the field perpendicular to the components now of the spins are considered to be zero. While in the new quantum mechanics, these components do not interchange with the components in the direction of the field. Well, the field is chosen anywhere, and then you choose the component of the spins, which is in the direction of the field, and study the model. So we know uh, uh, nowadays that's a difference between two different universality classes of models, a vector model with three components and a scalar model with only one component. And he said, Despite this difference, it is very likely that an extension of the theory of easing to the case of lattice with three dimensions would give ferromagnetism even from the classical point of view. Even if you treat this model with only one spin component with classical statistical mechanics. And in the next lecture, I will talk about the development of this model. You see, there were many people which come up in the later story, like Stern, Gerlach, Kramas, and Pauli again, and Van Fleck, who contributed a lot to the easing model. So I hope you will be interested in the next lecture. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Einart, for this nice, uh, nice introduction. To that. Thank you, thank you. Introduction in the history of the easing model. So that makes appetite for the next one, for the next lecture tomorrow. I guess we can have some questions, so we still have plenty of time to ask if there's none then I just start I mean the easing I mean the solution by easing of this one dimensional chain this was done with three boundary conditions no? is that right Reinhard, could you hear me? Yeah, muted, maybe, Professor Reinhard. Uh, is is there any any? No, there's no question. So I close the my. Uh, I asked. I asked just for questions, and uh, uh -huh. it was technically it was not really working. So, I mean, I had the question. Uh, yeah. The solution of easing of this one-dimensional chain. That yes. was with free boundary conditions. Is that true? Open boundaries? Yes, it was open boundaries. And you see, I had some variable delta. And so yeah. he started with a spin up on one side. And then he asked if at the end of the boundary uh, is the spin up or down. And therefore, he had two contributions to the microstates. And so he considered this. Uh, but as I will show you tomorrow, it was immediately generalized to closed boundary conditions and so on. And what I have to discuss is the thermodynamic limit. And this will be also in the next section. Well, I wouldn't discuss it, but it was not known that the thermodynamic limit is something important. So the boundaries were even more complicated, no? which he considered. No? Yeah, he, he had, yeah. so to say, open boundary, and he had to take into account both cases. And therefore, he had uh, such enormous, complicated uh, uh, expressions. So it's <coughs> even much easier if you close the ring and say, I have a ring of n spins, and then I go with the ring to the thermodynamic limit. Yeah. It's one page. I show you next lecture. 
but you need the transfer matrix, you see. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yes, a uh, It uh, is said that um, Pauli and Ising um, say both was at, in the same institute at the same time. And it is said that Pauli was not very amused about this, uh, this theory. And yeah. uh, uh, he, he was in a little bit distance, so it is said, yeah. to this uh, model. But it is very surprising that later on, Pauli has uh, uh, used the same basic idea on a, a higher level. So yes, I yes, think yes. it is a very good, uh, 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 both uh, influences of, of both th things. Yes, what I find surprising is that during the time of, of Easing's diseases, they worked in contrary directions, so to say. And, but later on they came, uh, well, it was 1930, Pauli and he came to easing, so to say. He, he recognized that this reduced model really has a big potential. And that's, that's what I find surprising. I mean, I also think that uh, Pauli, uh, well, Ising said himself that he discussed very much with Pauling. And as I give you a citation tomorrow, where Ising himself said that the, the old quantum mechanics, which was a basis in fact for his thesis, was very under strong discussion. Yeah. And it's so- It's a, a problem of the dialectic of science. Yes, yes. So it's a, it, it, was a, it was a fight of two positions and out of this fight then came, came the result of the Ising model. <laughs> Any further questions? May I put one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it was citation uh, in the second part of your talk where it was written that uh, uh, I believe that when the na uh, on other lattices, when the number of neighbors is eight and larger, yes. there will be transition. For me, it sounds it's not about dimension, but that's about number of neighbors. Do you consider this sentence as if uh, they assume that in one dimension, having next, next, nearest neighbor interaction, you would have phase transition or not? Or it is clear that it is about dimension? No, 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 no I, just, I, I just mentioned it for that reason. Because, I mean, they started from the idea that you have elementary ma magnets which uh, interact. And the interaction is quite different. It's a spin interaction and it's not a classical, in, in this sense, I would consider it, it's not a classical interaction and therefore it's a scalar interaction as Pauli recognized 1930. And it also was not recognized that it's not only the property of the number of nearest neighbors, which makes uh, uh, a system ferromagnetic or not, but it's a spatial dimension. And I mean, this was recognized only very late. You have to go into the 60s to see this. And on the other hand, I mean, there, and you know it very well, and Ralph Kenner also, you can also make linear models which have a phase transition. They are a little bit more complicated. They have more states and so on. That's the physics of uni to look for universality classes and what are the characterization of your universality classes. Even you see that if for two dimensions, you can say below two dimensions, you do not have uh, two dimensional vectors ordering magnetically. You need something else, costelit saulus and so on. So to find out starting from the easing model, what's important for phase transitions, that 
was the big idealization. This was the driving thing coming out of the easing model. And also that you recognize that you can, with the easing model, describe fluids, alloys, mixtures, and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Any further questions? Yes. We cannot hear you. Turn the speaker. My father was known for the first half of his life as Ernst Easing. In 1947, when he came to America, he added an E and it became Ernest Ising. Yeah. And I just thought I'd point that out. People yeah. have asked. We, so uh, I would start with this name only when he already had reached the United States. Yes. You see, then Ernst became Ernest and Johanna became Jane. And so that's, that's a transformation. I think he was always, uh, I mean, I like to, to, to give him his, his original name because he remained, uh, uh, how to say, he was, he loved physics as I understand it and he loved people. Yes. And therefore I think uh, that's a very general thing where he, he makes, he accepted, I think, all cultural conditions. So he accepted to be called Ernst and he accepted to be called Ernest. Yes. I just thought I'd make that point. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Reinhard, I would have one more question. Yes. In these early days, I mean, 1925 or 1930 or something, was Onsaga already involved in the game or not? No, no, Onsa, well, Onsaga uh, was very important in, um, he worked uh, uh, on other fields in statistical mechanics. Yeah. And in fact, he came to the easing model by uh, Elliot Montrol. Mm -hmm. Elliot Montrol introduced him to the easing model yeah. And because of his position, and I will tell you tomorrow, because Onsaga was married with an Austrian wife, he had much time at the Second World War because he was not involved in the uh, programs of military uh, looking for the atomic bomb and so on. And therefore, introduced by Montreal to the easing model, he started to do it. Mm -hmm. But he only could start to do it because other people have found very important features of the easing model before. Yeah. But anyway, it was a, it was a, really a big work, and not the end work. So I hope to end tomorrow my talk with uh, Jan, and even a little bit later. So he entered relatively late then, yeah? That's what you said. He entered relatively late to the easy model, but he had enough contacts to be yeah, informed yeah. on problems. In fact, he was not a physis physicist. He, was a, he had a doctorate in chemistry. Mm -hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and th therefore, he, was, he, he didn't belong to, this, uh, uh, to the, the physics people, so to say. But he had enough contacts in America to people working in these fields. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.